have had a sneak preview, yeah. When the 12-cylinder came, everybody was getting into the 12-cylinder. Now we have the 16, and uh, I'm sure a lot of companies are going to get into 16 now. With the Oscars, you don't know who the winner is. Here we know the winner right there. Chazetta Baroda, more than a work of art, a masterpiece. Italy's latest gift to the world and to you. Years ago, a new manufacturer of Italian supercars entered the market to compete with Ferrari and Lamborghini. The Cisetta Marauder V16T was a limited production GT car featuring a 16-cylinder motor, body designed by Marcello Gandini of Lamborghini fame, and financially backed by multi-Oscar winning composer and producer Giorgio Marauder, for which this new automobile company shares his name. Before the car went into limited production, there was a bitter breakup 18 months after the debut of Cisetta Marauder, with Giorgio parting ways with car creator and co-founder Claudio Zampoli. The car arrived at world-renowned restoration, service and sales specialist Canapa last year to begin its restoration. Christopher Karam, I'm a mechanic here at Canapa Design and I've been here a year. You walk into this shop and you look at the level of the cars and the cleanliness of the place and how organized. You talk to guys that even work in the industry and they're like, it's Bruce Canepa. So, you know, he's got a good name in it. The shop is impressive. The cars are insane. The prototype you see here was the only car to be badged with Giorgio's name. Giorgio retained the prototype after the breakup and it has been in storage since 1990. Nearly three decades later, Giorgio called upon a friend one who was the MC at the unveiling of Cisetta Marauder to help get the car back on the road again. It was Jay Leno who referred Giorgio to, to uh, Bruce Canepa. Jay and I have known each other for God, I don't know how long, long time. We're both car guys. He called me up and uh, asked me if I knew anything about this car, and I said no. And he asked me if I knew Giorgio, and I said no. And he asked me, um, I don't know, a handful of questions, I think, which were mostly no. And then, of course, I, I remembered the car from you know, back when they first unveiled it, I, I saw it somewhere. It, it, it kind of was everywhere. Pretty dynamic car in the day because it was a you know 16-cylinder motor, so everybody remembers seeing it. So then Jay proceeded to tell me that Giorgio still had the 01 car, the prototype, and it was not operational. Jay got Giorgio on the phone, and then we had a conversation, and Jay said he can make your car run, and he can get everything operational, and that's how it started. And here we are. The Chisetta was kind of hanging out, and then I showed up, so it was a decent fit where we got a new guy and a, and a kind of a weird car and put the two of them together and see if it'll dance. It ended up being that the key guy was Chris on the car and Chris has the most experience with Italian cars. Basically he was foolish enough to say he would work on it. <laughs> so, so that, there, there's your decision, it's done. The car showed up here, no one wanted to work on it. Just kind of one of those, it was so weird that everybody, and then uh, I was kind of okay with it right off the bat because it was a weirdo. Because he said yes without thinking about what he was going to have to work on. You know, the, the car's been difficult. I mean, it's there's nothing in it that's conventional. You know, it was a prototype and it was a lot. And, and I'm sure as a prototype, it was like, add this. Oh, and that didn't work. Now try this. And well, that didn't work. Try this. And so Chris has had to go back and re-engineer all the theories to get everything to work. And that's a challenge. And it's a challenge where there's days where you just you know, you can, you can, uh, you might smile, but you probably hate what you're doing for a little while, so. We spend at least two months looking for water pump seals. These are custom water pumps, but they use a seal that is an OE part, and it doesn't say what it's, but what it's, it's a custom water pump. It's a, it's a custom water and oil pump, yes, and the seals are, but the seals are, you know, OE parts, so you're going to have to hunt and pack and figure out you know, what's a water pump those seals might have, might have come from. You know, it's one of those deals where 
The first step with a car is to try to figure out how to get it running so you can drive it. Because as soon as you can get it to where you can drive it, then you're going to kind of open up a can of worms in terms of everything else that doesn't work. But you got to have it drivable. So, so the engine, the engine was really the first and biggest part of the task was to get the engine operational. I rebuild those fuel distributors, the warm-up regulators, all the injector lines, and then clean the injectors and get them, you know, put them all in, and then adjust everything, synchronize everything, you know, to get to run, you know, equal, you know? Well, some of it's guessing, but, but you have to start with a baseline. You have to start with, okay, what do we have to do to get it running? So you're going to start with that, and, and it, it's going to be as simple as, okay, does it have oil in it? Does it have water? Does the water pumps work? Does this work? You really have to go through every single individual system and see if it's performing as it's supposed to, or indoor, it's performing as it needs to for that thing to operate. Never operated on 16 no cylinders until yeah. Chris found that crossover, it was, it was and then uh, at, at maximum he had 14 cylinders going at maximum, but because of the way the mag was wired, we were still getting cross. I mean, we took it on the street and it was popping and farting out the back, and you know, I mean, serious backfires because the spark was going off at when it wanted to. So it was a corrupted signal to the other two cylinders because of the one mag. So one mag, because he has two magnetic pickups, Siamese, which is unconventional, but it's working. Um, as as the polarity was reversed, it was corrupting the other signal, is the nearest I could figure, because we had backfiring. So we had random misfires on the, on the on two cylinders. It became obvious that that engine has never been operational as a 16-cylinder engine, not that not this particular car, and. Um, so from air intake systems to water pumps to mechanical fuel injection to the ignition systems, nothing was totally operational for 16 cylinders. We that heard the car run, you could tell that it was, it was backfiring. I mean, you drove it down the street and people were like, somebody's shooting a gun? I mean, it was bad. You know, it was crossfire, backfire, out the tailpipe, you know, fuel being ignited out of time and going off in the exhaust system. So, uh, that, that, took, uh, that took a few hours to figure out. It was, it was the better part of a day so I could figure out because I kind of fooled myself. Um, I removed the magnetic pickup for the two cylinders that weren't functioning and I was able to trigger it using a soldering gun because it creates a field. So when you put the soldering gun near the magnetic pickup, it will excite the wire and tell the ECU that it sees a signal. So at that point I was able to identify that the magnetic pickup from the magnetic pickup to the ECU was a good clean line and under normal circumstances should be firing. So when the trigger comes by that mag pickup, it should tell the computer, we've just seen I've just seen the I've just seen a strobe, and the magnetic pickup will convert that into a signal to tell the coil. The coil's gonna send a spark, spark's gonna go to the distributor cap down the trail and send it to the wires. That was not happening. Once that was fixed, we could say that the car it, it, for the first time in his life, ran properly on all 16 cylinders when it was when it was here. It was just it was in their harness that was potted in. It was it was in resin. That's the way it was assembled from the time the car was born. So I had to go and dig all that shit out and flip them, and then we had 16 cylinders. And it was a different car. Fun. And and of course today it is. You've been in it. It's uh, it's a real car now. It drives down the road. We spent a little over a uh, thousand man hours working on this car. Hoping that we could make a, an escutcheon for that, you know, to tidy that up while the car was here, because it kind of it kind of asks for it, but we didn't get around to it. And, you know, going down the list of the things we really needed to attend to, it was, you know, on the on the back end of what we needed. So. Yeah, we're doing development at this point yeah. on, on how, to, how to shed. Yeah, because you don't want the, that gasoline gets way too hot. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so naturally we're going to end up wrapping the header, or the pipe at least, coming by this tank. Well, that's what Bruce wants, so we've got to do that. Climbing. But I think we put that pan there, you know, like, like Porsche does, you know, to get the heat away from the exhaust or motor mounts. They always put an aqueduct somewhere. Yeah. The headers kind of cook the gasoline. It makes the car kind of feel funny. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and wrap the headers and shield the gas tank so that he stays away from the tanks. They're a little too close, you see it? Yep. So it cooks the gasoline. And uh, so that's the only thing we really kind of have left to do to they, help this thing. They had heat shields in place, but uh, you know, obviously they didn't get to the level we're at right now. Yeah. So there's not much distance between the header and the gas tank. 
So you can see how it boils the fuel. You see what I'm saying? Closing that button thing. Scraping the glue off the, the gas tank. And we're oh. gonna put a new heat shield. The other heat shield you saw, it was all burnt away. Metal, it's, it's metal with fiberglass in between, and then there's a sticky pack. Fuel tanks, two fuel pumps, two fuel filters. It has an equalizing tube going from one side to the other to equalize the fuel. So what happens is, because there's only six gallons, roughly, or eight gallons in each tank, the vapor locks even quicker because the headers. So that's why we have to do all this. So it isn't buck going up a hill or after half hour or an hour. It just likes everything perfect, you know? Which is good. Makes it, makes it good for us. I checked it running. Oh, that's right. You checked I checked it running. It was like in the middle. Was it? Yeah, so it's obviously the same one. Very, yeah, you can see it's very tight. Look at the room. There's no room between this and the seat. It's so tight in here. So to get seats really out and not da you know, get seats in and out without damaging everything, you gotta really take your time, you know? Yeah, it feels good. Wait till you feel how it shifts now. Just step on the clutch, makes it better. Go reverse, it's got a nice reverse, it's much reverse. See? Boom. Right there. Remember you had to fight it a little bit? Click. You hear it? Yeah. First. First is a lot better. First. Yep. Dog look, yeah. The wire to the fuel sender was off. I noticed it blew the grill as I was just looking around the car. And so there are two wires. One wire is for the fuel level. Yeah. The other one is for when the fuel level comes all the way down, the, the back end of the lever hits a two pieces of metal touch and it turns the light on that says fuel level low as a light. So one of the wires was hanging out and I'm like, it better be the fuel level low light because they were telling me that the sender was working. So if the sender was working, then that low light isn't isn't connected. So I'm just gonna go and touch that to ground right now with the key on and see if the light lights up and see if I'm right. Yeah, the light's working. Yeah. That's cool. Ready to start engine? Tank of gas, they'll never see me again. basically the first time the car is hitting the road um, other than short little bursts to see if we have tuning and, and stuff right uh, so this is basically like a shakedown we don't really know what sidelined the car 20 years ago it could have been on a litany of things but overall the car seems to run fine and, and be, be doing all the things that it should be so it was like well let's take it on the road and see what happens from there you know once it's under a load and, and uh, it starts really being used you don't know I mean you can you can drive around a parking lot all day long it doesn't tell you much you know that's one thing about Bruce he wants to make sure a customer gets in their car and it is dialed in no ifs, ands, or buts. And he goes to great lengths to make sure that we make sure that that's the case. He'll have us chase squeaks and rattles. He doesn't want a customer listening to that. He wants the car to be the music. So ideally, I'd still be on the high. 
highway on my little road test loop. But we can reverse Paso Tiempo it. And normally we'd go down 17, get the car up to speed, and then uh, get off Paso Tiempo and then come back this way, which is uh, a good series of twists and turns and bumps so you can do your squeak and rattle test and uh, get an idea of suspension compliance, see if you have clearance, if you have anything going with the wheel arches. So it's a good road for that. Um, and it's kind of funny how we jump on the highway first because, you know, for my for my road testing, normally I'd, this would be the better way to go is let's get the low speed jounces and bumps out of the way before we get it up to, you know, a higher speed. I mean, you're you're aware of the weight behind you, so very, uh, very Countach, Diablo, Testarossi, and you know, you're definitely aware of the weight back there. Not too bad. Water temp's nice, oil pressure's good. And a full tank of gas, what state are we headed toward? Remember the tall gear, so she's a good cruiser. She's geared for high speed. Just over 2,000 RPM at 60. That's a tall ass, uh, that's a tall top gear. And he was like, no, no, the engine's the music. I was like, this comes from a composer. Good car, stable, good driving car, better higher speeds and lower, but nice. At this point, it's ready to be turned over to Tony, the, the road test guy, for a good, a good couple hundred mile run, which is what we do. And then, uh, barring anything crazy, uh, Bruce will get it, and then we get the real list, which is, you know, I mean, if we've done our homework, everything will be good, but then Bruce We'll pick out what he doesn't like. We take tackle those things, and then it goes to the customer. Well, I was uh, pleasantly surprised at how how well it drives because it's 30 years old. I mean, it's, you're talking about 1988, and I went out on the freeway in it. And Chris has had some time in it, but nobody's really gone out and really driven it fairly aggressively. I don't think not supposed to here yet. So, so I did that, and um, I, I did a couple laps back and forth to Santa Cruz just driving it and shifting it and stuff and making mental notes of little things that I wanted to see adjusted or changed. Bruce is great because he's a very he's a demanding guy that knows what he wants and that's better than a wishy-washy guy who you know let's he knows so once he knows and he says to you in plain English what he wants you get it done. Once I'd had a couple laps in it, then I started, you know, I mean, honestly, I went 140 miles an hour in it. And, uh, and it was smooth as glass, very stable, very comfortable, didn't take any extra effort, didn't take any professional effort to drive it. I mean, I just sat back and drove it. And I mean, it, it steered where I wanted to go and it did nothing that would, that would alarm you in any way. Uh, it stopped good, it shifted fine, it sounded good, it made decent power. I went through, a, there's a section of highway out here that transitions from highway in an off-camber curve from highway to crossing a bridge to back on the regular part of the highway and that upsets every car you take through that. It just kind of glided right through that, it didn't even care. And of course, it is a big car and it's got enough, enough track width and enough wheelbase and enough weight that that helps it make it very stable, but it, it didn't drive like a 30-year-old car. I mean, it drove more contemporary than that. It doesn't drive like a home-built car or a one-off uh, where it was incomplete or or they're still working out. You know, I mean, a lot of times you get in cars and, and you can literally feel torsional stiffness in a vehicle. Uh, you'll hear a lot of creaking. I mean, this is a this is a, a positive vehicle. It's even, even sending it through corners, you're not, you're not nervous, it's not a, it was a good, sure-footed vehicle and decent power delivery. And you know, you 
you're in something that everyone's trying to you know, cop a look and crane their neck. So, you know, fun. I think this car is a more refined car as a driving car than the Diablo was. I don't think the Diablo was, was, was this uh, stable, smooth, and efficient on the road in terms of driving. I don't think the Diablo was a bad car, don't get me wrong. When, after Countach is with it, the Diablo was a pretty darn good car. And because uh, the, the Countach, I love the Countach, but it was, you know, it was, it was kind of a tractor, you know. And uh, it, it steered heavy and, and you hit bumps and it changed lanes and, and uh, it, did, it didn't like sliding around very much. I did it in the car, but it wasn't something people were comfortable with. Um, it made a lot of noise. Th this car is much, this car is more refined than those cars were in that era. Yeah, well, the Diablo was a was a it was a big step forward over the the Countach, but I'd say this car was probably a step above that if you're in the same era. If you went back to 1988, as you mentioned, that would have been a very impressive car in 1988. That's about the best endorsement you can give a car when it's like that. No, it's good. I mean, I drives nice.